church, I'm excited. Today we're starting a brand new series called The Church in Philippi. It is going to be about the, the book of Philippians. And in this book, the book of Philippians is only four chapters. There's 104 verses. In fact, you can read it in about 15 minutes. So I encourage you over the next several weeks and months as we walk through this book of Philippians, I encourage you to read this book uh, each and every week. It's going to give you incredible insight, and then we'll gather and talk about it on Sundays, either online or in person, as we're going to talk about at the end of this, this service today. Um, but it, you'll, get, you'll gain insight into this book. You'll, you'll be able to discover incredible truth. Because the, the, the fact of the matter, this book of, of Philippians is, is full of what I call coffee cup Christianity. I imagine if you were to go into your pantry right now and you were to open it up and you were to look in there, you would find some coffee mugs with verses from Philippians written on it. Let me just give you some examples. Here's some that may be on your coffee mug. And this is, this is uh, from, let's just start with chapter 1. And I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion in the day of Christ Jesus. Another one, for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Chapter 2 picks up and says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. Let each of you look not to your own interest, but also to the interest of others. Are you finding any of these coffee mugs? I'm sure you've got some. Maybe you've got this. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and and to do the, the work of his good pleasure. Perhaps you've got this one. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is, head, what is ahead, I press on towards the goal of the prize that is in Christ Jesus. Now, this next one in chapter 4, I imagine all of you have. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Perhaps you've got this. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. One more that I, that I imagine many of you know. I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. In other words, this entire book of Philippians is full of some of the greatest hits of Bible memory verses that any of us have ever learned. But with, with that comes a problem. You see, I think we can learn these verses and we can know these verses by memory, but they become so familiar to us that they lose the depth that Paul meant them to have. They become sentimental phrases that we, we can quote and we can put on coffee mugs and we can even put on the eye black under our eyes during a, during a football game, but they lose the meaning behind them because these, these verses have incredible depth. Take rejoice in the Lord always, for example. That verse, for so many, both in the church and outside of the church, has become this motto of some sacrificial happiness. And when it does, it misses out on the incredible depth of the theological command that it actually is. Or the one I just mentioned, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, has become some, some idea that if I put it on my eye black, if I, if I write it on the bottom of my sneakers, I'll be able to play football or basketball better. Because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can beat my opponent on the court because Christ strengthens me. I can make this sale in my job because Christ strengthens me. But yet, when we, when, we, when we become so familiar with it and don't understand the context of it, and don't understand the meaning behind it, it loses all the meaning that Paul intended for it. And that's unfortunately what happens so often. But the thing about Philippians is it's a fascinating book. It's an incredible book book full of in, full of deep theological truth in fact the the book of philippians has often been called the epistle of joy joy is mentioned over 16 times in the book of philippians and oftentimes we read philippians and say oh it's just about having joy in the lord but yet 
the truth of the matter is that the book of Philippians is so much deeper than having joy in the Lord. In fact, Jesus and the gospel are mentioned over 60 times in those 104 verses. So yes, the book of Philippians, one of the major themes is joy. But it's not just joy for joy's sake. It's not just joy so that you and I are happy. No, it is joy because of the gospel. It is joy because of our maturity in the gospel. It is joy because of Jesus. You see, when we understand the context of the book of Philippians, we understand that joy and Jesus go together. That joy and gospel go hand in hand. And Philippians is also one of the few books that Paul, a few letters that he'd written that he's not addressing bad theology that needs to be corrected. He's not, he's, not, he's not challenging false teaching within the church. He's not correcting bad behavior. Instead, this book highlights Paul's affection for this church. It highlights his appreciation for their spiritual and Christian maturity. It's an amazing book. This letter to Philippians really begins to show you and I what Christian maturity looks like, and how we are to pursue it at all cost within our lives. It's an amazing book, and if you read read any of Paul's letters, you know that he's always telling people in the the other churches to do this or don't do that, to to stop this and start doing that. He's he's constantly correcting what's going on uh, within that church, but Philippians is different. Yeah, I mean, there are things, as, we, as we'll discover, that Paul is he's addressing in some instructions that he's giving the church. And, and he does, at some point, it seems that he's indirectly um, correcting some behavior within the church. But, but really, this book of Philippians possibly gives us the best picture in the New Testament of what a mature church looks like and what mature people within that church do. And Paul, when he writes to the Philippians, just shows this overflow of affection for them. Because you see, this church is special to Paul. It's not just a congregation of people that are under his care. The church in Philippi are people that that Paul calls friends. Listen to Philippians 1, verse 1. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus. Now let me stop right there, because... If you read the other epistles that Paul's written, he often starts with Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. He doesn't do that in Philippians. He says, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus. Why? Because the church in Philippi already understood his authority. They already understood who he was as an apostle of Jesus Christ. He didn't have to to throw out his titles. He didn't have to reset that within this church. They already knew that he was was the apostle. I mean, think about it as parents. If you're a parent and you have to tell your kids that, that you're the parent, that you're the father or you're the mother, there's something already gone sideways in that relationship. Like if you have to say, listen, I need you to go clean your room because I'm your dad or because I'm your mom. I mean, something's wrong in that relationship. But in the book of Philippians, Paul doesn't do that. He doesn't say, I need you to do this because I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ. He says, no, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and the deacons, grace to you and peace from God, our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. Then in verse 3, he says this, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. This is about 10 or 15 years after Paul planted the church in Philippi. And so for 10 or 15 years, he's had remembrance of this church. He remembers the people that started this church. And he says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. Always, in every prayer of mine for you. All making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel. From the first day until now. See, from the very first day Paul planted this church, he's saying, listen, you have partnered with me in the gospel. You've come alongside me with the gospel and for the gospel. And so to understand Paul's deep affection for this church, 
we have to understand the backstory. We have to understand how the church in Philippi got started. And we discover where the church in Philippi got started by turning to Acts chapter 16. And in Acts chapter 16, Paul has just come back with Barnabas from the council in Jerusalem. Now, if you're familiar with that, it's Acts 15. And the council in Jerusalem is where the early church determined that Gentiles didn't have to follow Jewish customs in order to be saved. They didn't have to follow the customs of Judaism in order to become Christians. They could simply become Christians. And so, after that happens, Paul and Barnabas decide to part ways and go their separate ways to carry on the gospel and the mission of the church to different places. And in Acts chapter 16, Paul partners up with a couple of other men, Silas and Timothy. And they set out to retrace the steps of Paul's first missionary journey. And so in this second missionary journey in Acts 16, they set out to go and encourage the churches that Paul had planted during his first missionary journey. And as they go, they decide they want to go to Ephesus. But as they're going to Ephesus, the Spirit prevents them from going to Ephesus and tells them, no, I don't want you to go to Ephesus. So then they decide we're going to go north. And they're going to head north instead of west. Ephesus was west. They said, we're going to go to Ephesus. No. They said, okay, we'll go north. And they try to go north. And again, the Holy Spirit prevents them from heading north. And so now they're just not sure where to go. They're trying to discern what God's will is. And in the midst of this time, in Acts chapter 6, Paul has a vision. He has a vision from a man from Macedonia. And in that vision, one night, this man says, come, help. Come preach the gospel to us. Come meet us. And so Paul, Silas, and Timothy set their course for what is now modern-day Greece. And this becomes a turning point in the history of Christianity. For the very first time, Paul sets foot in Europe. Up until this point, the gospel had not gone to Europe. The gospel had not spread to Europe. The gospel was in, it was in the Middle East. And now, now the gospel is going to Europe. And we all know the history of, 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 the, of Christianity throughout Europe. You just head over there and you can see all the, the vast churches and the, the incredible historical evidence of the spread of Christianity throughout Europe. In fact, Christianity came to the United States from Europe. And so it, this is the first time that Paul sets foot in Europe. And his first stop was the city of Philippi. And Philippi was, was not, a, not the largest city, but it was an incredibly influential city. See, the city of Philippi set really in, the, in this major highway between the east and the west. It's set right there in the, in the middle of this, this thoroughfare of trade that really brought together this melting pot of cultures. It was a blend of those from the east and those from the west. Those from, the, from Asia and the Middle East and those from Europe. And that's where Philippi sits. And so Paul, for the very first time, sets foot in Europe in the city of Philippi. Here's what you need to understand. At this point, there are no Christians in Europe. None. Christianity has not spread to Europe yet. In fact, when Paul gets to Philippi, there's not even a Jewish synagogue in Philippi. And the way we know that, the reason we know that, because historically it took ten Jewish men to form a synagogue. That was enough to create a synagogue. And there is no synagogue in Philippi. At this time, which means there's not even a large enough presence of Jews in the city of Philippi to constitute a synagogue. And so Paul, when he when he gets to Philippi, instead of finding a synagogue, he discovers this group of women that have gathered together for prayer. And in Acts chapter 16, we're going to see three conversions that really paint a picture of the church in Philippi. 
And it will give us incredible insight as we continue in this study of the book of Philippians. So Acts chapter 16, beginning in verse 11. And here's what it says. So, setting sail from Troas, we made a direct voyage to Samothrace, and the following day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi which is a leading city in the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city some days. And on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside where there was supposed to be a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the women who had gathered there. And one woman who heard us was a woman named Lydia. And she was from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods who was a worshiper of God. And the Lord opened up her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. Afterwards, she was baptized in her household as well. She urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be, a faith, to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. In other words, she convinced them to stick around and stay at her house. So this first conversion in Europe, is this woman named Lydia. Now, Lydia was a businesswoman. She was a wealthy businesswoman. And she was from the city of Thyatira, which, mean, which was part of Asia Minor, which means ethnically she was Asian. And she was wealthy, and she'd made a lot of money. In fact, she, it says that she sold purple goods, which means that she was a fashionista in her day. When Paul, Silas, and Timothy rolled up on this prayer meeting, she was probably there in her Yeezy sandals and her Gucci, uh, with her Gucci satchel. I mean, that's, this type, that's the woman that she is. Incredibly wealthy. She probably had homes all over the place, both in, in Europe and in Asia, because she had made money selling this purple linen, which was incredibly expensive. It was worth its weight, literally in gold. And the Bible says that she was a worshiper of God. Some translations say she was a God-fearer, which what that means is that she, was, she did not accept the paganism of her day. She didn't accept the, the polytheism of her day. She believed that there was one God, one true God, and so she had bought into Judaism. But yet, she's spiritually confused. She's not a follower of Christ yet. She's not a believer in Jesus Christ at this point. And she's trying to go to this prayer meeting to understand the Scriptures, to get a grasp on what it means to follow God. So Paul shows up, and he begins to explain it to them. He begins to walk them through the Gospel. He begins to say, listen, you've been reading the law, and the law is incomplete. The law was there to point us towards our sin. But Jesus came along to redeem us from our sin. He came along to die on the cross and rise, rose, rise from the grave. And because of that, you and I can be redeemed. And so they hear the Gospel. They grasp the Gospel. And she becomes a believer in Jesus Christ. In fact, her entire family gets saved. And baptized. And so Lydia becomes the very first convert to Christianity in Philippi. And she invites Paul and Silas and Timothy to stay at her house. But the story doesn't end there. While they're staying with Lydia, since there's no synagogue, they would constantly go back to the river to this place of prayer. And that's where Paul would present the gospel. Because if you, if you read the history of Paul and the way his missionary journeys would go, oftentimes he'd get to a city and he'd preach first to the Jews in the, in the synagogue and then to the Gentiles. Well, since there's no synagogue, he would go to this place of prayer where, where the Jewish believers would gather and they would pray and they would read Scripture together. And here's what happens next. It says that as they were going to the place of prayer, so Paul, Silas, and Timothy are heading to the place of prayer, they were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by her fortune telling. She followed Paul and us crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many years. Day. So day in, day out, this girl, this young slave girl who is demon possessed, follows Paul, Silas, and Timothy around, yelling out, These are servants of the Most High God. These men are proclaiming to you the way of salvation. So over and over, she's just yelling, just in this crazed fit at the top of her lungs, just yelling over and over and over again as Paul, Silas, and Timothy walk through town. Well, listen to what happens next. Well, Paul, having been greatly annoyed, 
turned and said to the Spirit. Notice he didn't talk to the girl. He spoke to the Spirit. He said, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out of her that very hour. I want you to notice the stark contrast between Lydia and this demon-possessed slave girl. Lydia is Asian. This girl is more, more than likely Greek. Lydia was wealthy. This girl was impoverished. Lydia was in control. This girl was enslaved and exploited. This, Lydia was a seeker of God, a worshiper of God. This girl was demon-possessed. And I want you to watch how Paul reaches her. Paul doesn't invite her to a Bible study. Paul doesn't say, listen, I'm going to hold a conference tomorrow, a, a seminar tomorrow on crazy, and I'm pretty sure you're full of a lot of crazy, so you might want to come to that. No, he doesn't do that at all. He doesn't appeal to her intellect. He doesn't appeal to her reason. She's demon-possessed. She, she has no reason and in, in intellect in that way. Instead, what Paul does through the power of the Holy Spirit is he rebukes the demon that is possessing her and in the name of Jesus, commands the demon to come out of her. And as a result of that, this demon, once demon-possessed slave girl, becomes the second convert in Philippi. She gives her life to Christ. She becomes a follower of Jesus. And Paul, the, these Philippian conversions begin to start painting a picture of the church in Philippi. Notice the diversity of the church. You've got Lydia, a wealthy uh, Asian woman. You've got a Greek slave girl that's also become a follower of Jesus. And the gospel in both of those cases were presented based on the person's individual needs. To Lydia, Paul engages her intellectually. He opens up the scripture, walks her through the gospel, through the Old Testament, and then teaches her the gospel. But to the slave girl... He reaches her through an act of mercy, through service, by saying, listen, demon, come out of her. He serves her, releases her from her bondage, releases her from her oppression. And in both instances, the Holy Spirit brings about new birth and repentance. What an incredible picture of the gospel and how you and I can share it in multiple ways by meeting people where they are. But as it turns out, the slave girl's owners were not very happy. They made a lot of money by exploiting this girl and her demon possession. They made a lot of money by her telling fortunes. And when they discover that that, is, that demon is gone and she's no longer of value to them, they grab Paul and Silas, throw them before a judge in the city, and nearly create a riot in the city. Listen to what happens. But when her, when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas, dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, These men are Jews, and they are disturbing our city. That's a false accusation. They were not disturbing the city. All they had done was presented the gospel and released this girl from her oppression. The advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. That's what they're pushing. And then verse 22, the crowd joined in in attacking them, and the magistrates tore their garments off, meaning Paul and Silas's gave orders for them to be beaten with rods. And then they, when they had afflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them in the inner prison, which is the deepest, darkest part of the prison, and he fastened their feet in the stocks. Now, Paul and Silas are not given any chance to dispute the claims that are against them. They're not given an opportunity for cross-examination. Instead, the judge orders them that they be stripped, beaten, and thrown into prison. And that's exactly what happens. For what? What did they do? They shared the gospel. 
They talked about Jesus. They freed this young girl from demon possession. You would think that would be a good thing. And yet Paul and Silas find themselves bruised, bloodied, and beaten. Thrown into the deepest, darkest part of the prison with their feet in chains. Bound in this prison with very little hope. I don't know about you, but I'm pretty sure my response would have been very discouraging. I don't know about you, but I'm, I have a feeling that I would have been like, God, I was doing what you called me to do. I was doing what you've asked me to do. I was just simply obeying you, God, and look where it, found, look where it ended up. Not Paul and Silas. Listen to what happens next. It's amazing, incredible what these two men do. In verse 25, about midnight... Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. So Paul and Silas don't complain. Paul and Silas don't, uh, don't sulk. What do they do? They throw a worship service. They start singing and worshiping the Lord in the midst of this prison. And suddenly, during the middle of their worship service, a er great earthquake came so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. Now, why was he doing that? Because in that day, back in Roman law, if you were a jailer and you were over a prisoner and that prisoner escaped, you had to pay for that prisoner with your very life. And so the jailer is just going to help the Roman authorities uh, and, and do it himself. He doesn't want to go through the punishment that they would put him through for losing these prisoners. And then we'll listen to what happens. But Paul, Paul cries out in the prison in a loud voice saying, Do not harm yourself. We are all right here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in. And trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and he said, Sirs, what? must I do to be saved? What do I need to do to have the same salvation that this slave girl received? What do I have to do? And they said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house, his entire family. And he took them that same hour of the night, washed their wounds, and he, was, and, the, and he was baptized at once, he and all of his family. Then he brought them up into his house and set food before them. And he rejoiced along with his entire household that they had believed in God. This third conversion is, a, is a, an amazing story to help us continue to develop this picture of the church in Philippi. You see, this jailer was simply a, a blue-collar, middle-class guy. He's not, in, he's not interested in intellectual banter. He, he really probably is not very interested in, in spiritual things to begin with. I mean, he he's probably doesn't sit around and think about the meaning of life. This guy, this jailer, is more than likely just a regular guy who just wants to do his 9-to-5 at work, put in his time, go home to his family, kick back in the recliner and watch the game. That's more than likely who this man is. And a lot happens while Paul and Silas are in jail. They pray, they sing, this earthquake comes. The jailer assumes they, they escaped and, and he's getting ready to, to fall on his sword. Paul stops him. He presents the gospel to him. And he and his entire family give their lives to Christ. But how, how does the gospel grab a hold of this man? I believe as we read that story, we see that Paul engages him through his example. Paul engages him by the fact that first and foremost, they sang and worshiped in the midst of this suffering. I think he engages them by their example in the fact that they did not escape even though they had plenty of opportunity to do so. They could have even said, listen, God set us free by this earthquake. Let's go. Let's escape. No. What do they do? They stick around. They stay and they share the gospel. And this jailer is blown away by their example. 
so much so that he, is in, he and his entire family are saved and baptized. You know, as we look at this, this these three conversions in the midst of, of the, the beginning of the church in Philippi, we see three stories of three different people all reached in three different ways. Paul was willing to meet people where they were. He met Lydia as she was studying Scripture. So what does he do? He uses his words and his intellect and his knowledge of Scripture to walk her through the Gospel to the point where she believes. He meets this slave girl, this demon-possessed, that's spiritually distraught. And what does he do? He uses an act of mercy to set her free from her bondage and oppression. Then he meets this jailer who, who is, is blown away by the example and Christ-likeness that Paul and Silas exhibited. Three different conversions reached in three different ways through intellect, through service, and through an example. It's an amazing picture of the church in Philippi, and that is how this Philippians church began with a wealthy Asian woman, a poor Greek girl, and a middle-class Gentile. Now, if you were to go and plant a church, that's probably not going to be your dream team. You're probably not going to think, well, those are the three that I would pick. But when Paul says in Philippians 1, to all the saints, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi, you know who he has in mind? He's thinking about Lydia. And he's wondering, I wonder how much she's helped advance the gospel through her wealth. He's thinking about that young girl that, that was demon-possessed and was set free. And he's wondering, I wonder if she's married now. I wonder how Jesus is using her to advance the gospel now. And he's thinking about that jailer who was really rough around the edges. And he's wondering, man, I wonder if that dude... How God is using that guy, and if he's still a little bit rough around the edges. See, when Paul says to all the saints in Philippi, it's personal. It is real. He knows these men and women. And that's the beauty of the gospel. You see, the gospel doesn't just reconcile you and I to God. It doesn't just save sinners and reconcile us Un unholy people to a holy God. No, what the gospel does, it also takes strangers. People with very little in common and makes them family. That's the purpose of the church. That's why God designed the church to be the way that it is. That you and I would come together as strangers, come together as people with very little in common and become a family. And that's exactly what we're seeing in the church in Philippi. We're seeing these uncommon people brought together through the power of the gospel to form a new family, a new community. As I was studying this passage, I found and discovered that historically, Jewish men would often pray, and their prayer would be this, Dear God, I thank you that I am not a woman, a slave, or a Gentile. Now think about this. The very first church God plants in Europe consists of a woman, a slave, and a Gentile. Now there were other brothers and sisters that were saved at that, in, that, in that time, but the three that we're introduced to are a woman, a slave, and a Gentile. What is God doing? He's saying, listen, I have come to create a brand new community. I have come to create a brand new body. I am turning everything, literally everything, on its head. He is saying that the gospel transcends race, transcends class, transcends status. God is saying that the gospel cannot be stopped by socioeconomic differences. The gospel cannot be stopped by racial differences. It cannot be stopped by the religious walls that we build up between one another. He's saying the gospel is bigger than all of that. Which just reminds me and proves to me once again that the church 
The church should be the most diverse group in our city. The church should be beaming with diversity. The church should have people from every race, every socioeconomic status, every single class should be the church. But unfortunately, we rarely see that in the church these days. See, often Sunday mornings are the most segregated time in our week. And it should not be that way. We should repent of that and say, listen, we understand that the gospel transcends all of that. It transcends our ethnicity. It transcends our, our nationality. It transcends our political views. It transcends all of that. And the gospel is bigger than any division that we put between one another. And that's what we see in the, in the church in Philippi. See, because Paul, because Paul was willing to risk his life for the gospel, because he was willing to lay down his life to bring the message of life in Christ, what once was divided is now united. Church, that's the same way it should be with us. We should be willing to lay down our lives, to lay down everything about us so that what is divided now in our culture can be united under Christ, can be united in the gospel. We know that Lydia did the same thing. In fact, we know historically that she made her home available to the church. That Lydia literally used her home as a means of building up the church in, in Philippi, but also there was a church that... that was started in Thyatira, where her hometown was located. And we know that Lydia used her home and used her wealth to advance the gospel. It's an incredible picture of what the church should be and how the church should be. And I encourage you, and I encourage myself to do the exact same thing. To lay down our lives and say, I want to give it all for the gospel. How can we do that? First and foremost, we can share the gospel and share the scriptures, introduce the Bible to people, just like Paul did to Lydia. What did he do? He appealed to her intellect. See, some of us, you may need to start a Bible study in your neighborhood. You may be able to start a Bible study in your home, invite your neighbors over and say, let's just talk about the Scriptures. You may need to start a conversation with someone at work and say, let's just talk about Jesus. Let's just talk about the Gospel. Well, some of us need to begin those conversations, those spiritual conversations with people. We need to share the Gospel with those that are seeking For some, it could be as simple as inviting your neighbors to church online. Inviting them to watch and then talking about it afterwards. It could be as simple as, as starting that Bible study in your home. So we first and foremost, we need to start by sharing the gospel with those that are seeking. But also, we need to serve those who are hurting. Listen, there are many people that are hurting. Many people that are suffering right now. Many people that are in, under oppression They've lost their jobs. They've lost their income. They don't know how, to, how they're going to pay their bills. And, and we as a church can come alongside them. We as individual members of this church can come alongside and serve those that are hurting. We can serve those that are in pain. We can serve those that are, in, that are oppressed. Just like Paul did with this demon-possessed slave girl. He came alongside and offered acts of mercy, acts of grace, acts of service. Listen, during this season, we need to be looking out and doing anything and everything we can to serve the most vulnerable around us. So we need to share the gospel with those that are seeking. We need to serve those that are hurting, but we also need to spend time with people who are far from God. Simply allowing people that are different than us, allowing people that are far from God, allowing people that don't know Christ yet to get close enough to us to see Jesus in us. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about allowing people to see Christ in us. I'm talking about living in such a way 
that people will look at our lives and say, man, there is just something different about you. There's something different in the way that you've handled this, this coronavirus. There's something different in the way that you operate at work. There's something different in the way that your marriage functions and the way that you raise your kids. And I want to know about that. And then we have the opportunity to share with them the hope that we have in Christ, just like Paul did with this jailer. See, we need to, first and foremost, in order to do that, we've got to allow people close enough to us. See, I'm afraid so often we as Christians, and the longer we follow Christ, the more we isolate ourselves and insulate ourselves from people that don't know Christ yet. And so we as a church need to share the gospel with those that are seeking. We need to serve those that are hurting, and we need to spend time with people that are far from God and allow them to get close to us. And if you do, if you do, I am confident that He who began a good work in you will complete it, will bring it to completion in Christ Jesus. I am confident that God will use you to advance the gospel. That God will not only advance the gospel in you, He will advance the gospel through you. And I believe I believe that people who are strangers now will become family. They will become brothers and sisters in Christ. But first of all, we have to take the risk and share the gospel with those that are seeking, serve those that are hurting, and spend time with those that are far from God. Let's pray. Father, we're amazed at this launching of this church in philippi and just the story behind it and it's a fascinating story it's a it's an incredible story of how you started the first church in europe and the reality is that it is from that church that the gospel spread toward the west the, that the gospel spread towards uh eventually to where we are today and it all started with these three incredibly diverse people a woman a slave and a gentile and God, it's just an incredible reminder for us to know that the church, your church, should be the most diverse congregation, the most diverse gathering in our city. Because that's the type of community you came to create. And so, Father, I pray that you would give us strength and you would give us courage to reach out to those that are different from us. To realize that the gospel transcends race, it, it transcends economics, it transcends everything. And Father, help those of us who are your followers to share the gospel with those that are seeking, to serve those that are hurting, and to spend time with those that are far from you so that they can see Jesus in us. We pray this in His name. Amen.